Hey everyone, it's Fred here from Hillian's Bricks and I hope you're well. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking about, you know, the true facts of running a Brickling store. I've been running a Brickling store for the past two years now and I just want to share my findings. And the purpose of this video is not to encourage or discourage anyone from uh, starting or running a Brickling store. I just want to share my perspective and my thoughts about it that may help you in the future, whether you want to decide setting up a Brickling store or not or uh, yeah, whatever you want to do. So first of all, I just want to make sure that this is well known. Bricklinks is not a get rich quick scheme, right? Uh, contrary to what other people might say, it's not an easy money making scheme, I would say. There is no such thing. You know, it's actually quite the opposite. It's a lot of hard work for very little profit potentially. But yeah, I'm going to be talking about lots of different aspects. Some of them might be quite obvious and others and um, some of it might not be as clear and i'm also going to be sharing some numbers towards the end of the video so make sure you st uh, stay tuned till then so the first one that's obvious is you need space um here in the uk it's quite difficult to find lots of space to store unless you have a big house uh we don't have the luxury of many basements like people in the north americans might do where they have loads of storage potential and can really expand quite a lot so from our perspective here that's quite a big constraint we are now at pretty much full capacity in this room i would say there is also the aspect of setup cost when you start so you've got to take into consideration quite a lot of things you know you've got to find out these units uh, all sorts of things where you're going to be storing your lego you know you need thinking about printers um uh, scales also thing packaging equipment all those sort of things and we do actually have a link in this video where you can actually find a lot of the equipment that we tend to use for our bricklink store so it's kind of a, a bricklink essential list there's also a steep learning curve when you start uh, on bricklink so i've been running for two years now and i'm still learning every day bricklink the platform itself is quite old i would say and it's outdated the interface isn't that great and it takes a while to get used to as well. You've got to learn also the colors. You've got to learn, you know, the parts, where you can find the parts. All those sort of things do take a lot of time. And uh, yeah, the interface, I would say, is, is not self-explanatory. I know I've had some people who started uh, running a Brickling store and they made some issues. You know, they had some issues setting up the postage, uh, everything. And they didn't have orders for quite a while until, until they realized they had done something wrong. So... Yeah, it's not self-explanatory always. So the next thing I already mentioned is postage. You've got to learn all the different postage rates to understand who you're going to be using um, to do all your shipping and then obviously apply those rates uh, into Bricklink or you might choose a flat rate if you want to keep it simple. But those are all the sort of things you need to be aware of as well. And postage rates do tend to change. So you need to update those as well. And then it comes to the most important part as well is buying so you need to know where to buy what to buy when to buy it what sort of pricing you need to buy that kind of comes with experience and you also learn you know what sets even though the price might be good you might not necessarily want to buy because some of the colors or the parts in there will unlikely do well from a selling perspective and then you got to figure out really what sort of bricklink store do you want to run do you want to have predominantly new parts which is what i do um, but also start having used. Used does take a lot more time uh, to, to manage, but can be more lucrative, but it takes a lot, lot more time. Or maybe you just want to deal in minifigures. Lots of people do that as well. Or you just want to sell sets. Uh, I would say if you start to look at selling minifigures in sets, you'd probably be better off on eBay to do that. Um, typically you get some higher margins. Uh, or you might just want to sell used sets, which Bricklink can be a good platform as well. So you can buy used sets and resell them on uh, Bricklink. Then it comes to part out values. So it's important to understand part out values and how they kind of work, right? So the part out values is essentially all the va all the parts that get sold on Bricklink for every single set have a value and an average six month average value based on the sales through the platform. And then you can get a part out value for every single set. Now, when a new set launches, the part out value starts high and rapidly declines, especially if there's a uh, Lots of new parts in there because some new parts, when they start selling, the first wave tends to go at a much higher inflated price. So prime example I can give you at the top of my head is the Fox's Lodge from Minecraft. That set had, uh, I think it was 11 two by six orange bricks and they were going at the stupid price of about one or two pounds a brick. And that really inflated the part out value. So if you were to look at it now, it's much lower than it was before so you got to understand the trend over part out value and where does this set sit is it a new set old set how long has it been out so if it's 
in the first year they tend to go down by 20 to 25 percent sometimes so there is a big drop in part of values which clearly also has a big impact on your inventory value over time and one thing you also got to understand is markets are very different whether you're based in the us uh, uk europe anywhere every single um, part is kind of different i've noticed that here in the uk we tend to have one of the worst ratios when it comes from a part out value when i look at the sets versus the rrp pricing now i do a lot of that ana analysis on a monthly basis and i've kind of seen that when we look at it uk tends to be the worst but then we do get a lot more deals than lots of the other markets as well so that kind of compensates for it so you've got to really start hunting for the deals to make it worthwhile and you also got to start looking at buying variety of sets the more variety you have the more likely you will generate sales because it's not necessarily all driven by price unless people just want a particular one piece it's all about having as much variety as possible the more lots you have you know when someone can buy it from one person they'll buy it from one person rather than from two people and having to pay shipping costs twice right so that's kind of obvious so if you have lots of variety you're more likely to uh, generate sales and it kind of brings me to the next point of talking about competition so there's not much we can do about competition uh, since I started, uh, I think two years ago now, just over two years ago. Initially, BrickLink had about 11,000 stores. Now we're, I think we're close to 13,600. So in that period of two years, it has grown quite a lot in terms of stores available. And I'm not sure if the demand has increased as much as well, right? Then there's here in the UK specific, when I started, it was about 1,100, 1,200 stores that were open. I just checked earlier today, we're over 1,400 right now. So more people are selling on BrickLink and ultimately that's more competition. And it kind of brings it back to buying variety. Uh, if you, everybody starts buying the same sets to part out, then it becomes a race to zero in terms of the best pricing that's going to win, right? So that's why you need to have the variety of elements in your store to, to kind of drive uh, sales. Um, so those are the sort of things you need to watch out for. And then there's the uh, next topic I want to talk about that's often overlooked and uh, underestimated, and it's time management. So got to realize that BrickLink takes a lot of time and a lot of your time, and you need to be able to dedicate a lot of time if you plan on running it. So on a, sm on a slow week when we don't have lots of orders and we're not really parting out much, I would say we still tend to spend about 10 hours a week in here just uh, running the BrickLink store. Because there's a thing, it's like you want to part out stuff. you got to pick and pack new orders when you get them. you also got to look for shopping. you got to buy stuff. And you know, and there's also the bookkeeping side because so, you do have to pay your tax. So you got to keep all track of everything. So all those sort of things take a time. And sometimes you get an order and it might be something like, 200 pieces with 100 lots. Now, let me tell you, those are not great orders, even if you think it is, because 100 lots means you have to find 100 different places to find it. And that can easily take over an hour to pick one order. So those are the sort of things you might overlook and not realize how much time it actually takes to, to run this. And then from a shopping perspective, you got to find the right deals now and also what's right, what the right set to buy, which ones are now. We might be able to help you here. We do have a Patreon website where we provide a top 25. I think currently it's in the UK, US, Canada, and Australia, where we offer the top 25 sets by part at value to, to buy based on the Lego RRP. Now, we also give target prices for all the other sets, depending on what part at value ratio you're looking for. So if you're interested in that, go and check out our Patreon website. It's a fiver a month. Now, coming back to other questions that we often get realized is like, at what point do you break even or start to make profit? Well, how long is a piece of string, right? It ultimately depends on what what your goal is in here because let me tell you, when you start BrickLink, the one thing you will get obsessed about is to start growing and how much more can you grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when you typically buy Lego sets, you're looking for a part out value ratio of three or above. And the, the reason why that is, is because you want to have one third of the items you will sell kind of brings back, you know, the cost of your original investment of buying those lego sets so you get your money back and then the next third is kind of like your profit or your ability to grow your store because when you make that money back from the first third you're probably going to reinvest it and buying more parts to keep replenishing and you're going to want to grow and then there's a final third which might never sell or will take forever to sell so yeah it doesn't you it depends how quickly you want to grow and what 
kind of what point your break even point is and it also depends on on demand right and your pricing strategy but most people tend to work off the six month average value so uh in terms of you know what do i classify as a good month and a bad month now i'm going to show you some numbers now now and this is based on selling on bricklink but i also use brick owl and i also use ebay I think, and then I sell on Amazon, but I don't sell parts on it. So I'm purely focusing here from selling Lego parts uh, and minifigures uh, on those three platforms. So a bad month for me would be around six, seven hundred pounds turnover. Uh, that's not profit, so that's just in, in sales value. A good month, uh, it's probably about two thousand, two thousand five hundred pounds in turnover. Now remember, that's not profit. That's before any fees, anything like you buying your Lego your postage, everything like that. So just to give you some indication, I've got 380,000-ish parts in my store currently. So that gives you some sort of uh, understanding of what kind of numbers we're talking about. Another thing that I've learned so far is that not everything will sell. You'll probably, I've probably got parts in here that I will be, if I still run this store in five, six years time, that are already in here, they'll still be there in that time. So you gotta expect that to happen. Now, you might have a different strategy in terms of dealing with those. Uh, I've got some ideas in my mind, but I haven't executed them. But yeah, there will be parts that will never sell. But then those parts over time be may become valuable because if Lego suddenly decides to stop producing those and people still want them, then that could become a valuable part as well. So it's, yeah, it's uh, what do you do with those, right? Um, so yeah, it's important to understand that not everything will sell. Then one thing I've also learned is that and I think that cashback is almost essential when you run a Brickling store. So there's two platforms that we use. It's QuitQuo and Top Cashback, and we recommend you sign up for those. It's for free. And there's a link in the description of this video. But those cashback, they give you extra margins, and it just makes sense to get that extra margin because it's it's free money. And when you start up, it's, it all adds up. And those are all the things you're starting to look for is adding up all the value and every single percentage margin that you can get is what you got to take. Even if it's just 1%, you just got to take it. So make sure you don't underestimate the, the power of cashback. And then there's another uh, big thing, um, which depends on what sort of person you are. It's customer management. Now, clearly you need customers to make this work. And, uh, from time to time you will get some issues you will get some sometimes not even big issues but someone will place an order and they say oh i missed the part can you add that to it and it's like well are you going to pay me for it or what are you going to do or you know those are the sort of things the queries that you got to deal with or sometimes say oh i don't want that part anymore so you gotta deal with refunds or you know and sometimes you're gonna to have to take a hit uh, when it comes to like fees that you have to pay to paypal whether you're going to refund that or not just from a gesture of goodwill because you might think in the longer term if you do that that customer will come back or yeah it's it's always dealing with issues right sometimes you'll have parcels that go missing and it might not be of your fault if you're on so you got to deal with the postal service trying to trace it and refund and get claim money back those are all the sort of things that people never talk about or never publicly share about running a brickling store but it's part of the things you have to deal with and it's it's not the fun side right because the fun side is just selling and then hopefully you don't have any issues but that's not how it goes and sometimes you gotta have to deal with unrealistic expectations from your customer i've got an example the other day where this was order was placed late on a thursday night and clearly we picked it like on the friday we tend to ship everything uh first class the person lives in northern ireland so it takes a bit longer to ship there and he received a parcel on Tuesday. So there was a weekend in between. And I got a neutral feedback. That was my first ever neutral feedback saying like, oh, postage took longer than expected. Now, well, what do you expect? <laughs> this is not like, uh, you know, five days turnaround. Well, actually four and a half plus a weekend in between with the shipping in between. Sometimes people have unrealistic expectations. And if that sort of things agitates you or those sort of things really irritate you well get ready for it because it will come uh, personally it irritates me because i always try to make sure we got the best customer service uh, possible but you will always have people like that so just be aware of that one thing that people also don't talk about as here is once you pretty much get started with running a brickling store 
there's not an easy way out if you want to quit. Now, and what do I mean by that? It's like, if you want to suddenly say, well, this is not for me anymore, you're going to set up, sell up shop. It's not like you can sell up all the parts quite quickly. Uh, you would have to reduce your pricing a lot. So that's one avenue. But one thing you tend to see the most happen is people will sell their shop. And when they do that, expect the vultures to come around and you're not going to get the price that you want to get, right? Because typically what people are going to expect is your inventory value uh, of your part and you can divide that by three, then you might get some interest. So that's when people will probably buy your stuff if you have a big hit on your inventory value. So that's just out there. People realize if they get into it, you know, if you want to get out of it, it's not an easy way to get out of it. So beware of that. Um, then the final question or the kind of topic I want to talk about is like, is there something you could do full time? Now, there are people online there in the US and in the UK as well who do this full time. And from my perspective, I can't see how this could work full time just purely on parts unless you have a big space to do this. I would, from my expectation from income to do this right, I would need to have a few million bricks to make this uh, run full time. I can't see it happening just on new bricks. I think you would have to invest your time in used bricks, which has the higher margins, but takes a lot more time as well. And you can't just do it on BrickLink, I'm afraid. I think you need to start selling sets because the retired sets is where the money is at. Selling parts gives you keeps going on and kind of gives you ticking over in terms of revenue. But I think the money to be made is actually in buying and selling sets once they retire. And just parts you would need I would say three four million parts to get a decent income out of it at least that's my view of it so now the question looms like Fred why did you get started if this is all so negative well it's fun I must say you know Lego is my hobby I've learned a lot and you get to really engross yourself into Lego and I don't mind doing this uh, but the true fact is that I always wanted to get into Lego investing but I didn't want to wait for two, three years for Lego sets to retire and then see a return on investment. So that's kind of why I started a Brickling store. It's like, well, the cash flow should come in quicker. Maybe that cash flow can then generate me buying sets to invest. And that's kind of what I've done. Uh, but along the line, I also wanted to grow all the time. And I'd still love to grow, right? But space constraints, I do have a big backlog of sets to part out. But yeah, that's kind of why I got into it. But yeah, there's a, an overview of the true facts of Brickling. Now, I'm pretty sure I've missed a few of them or quite a lot of them. Let me know in the comment section if there's any obvious ones that you as a Brickling seller or watching might have experience as well and willing to share. But yeah, I hope this was useful. And uh, for anyone who's considering Brickling store, make sure you go and check out our Discord server. We have over 800 people on there now. Lots of them are Brickling sellers and we have an open community with lots of feedback. So we definitely recommend that to join that one. But yeah. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.